So, hello, friends. So, I'll be giving a very brief overview on this uh, drug, Eplerenone. I'm sure many intensivists who are hearing to this have used this drug. So it's very similar to spironolactone. It's a mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist, and it's a potassium sparing diuretic. So I wish to acknowledge my colleague, uh, Dr. Pratibha, who helped me develop this content. So when you look at this mechanism of action, uh, it's a aldosterone receptor antagonist. So this is an aldosterone, and these are the aldosterone receptor. So the pleuronone uh, acts as an antagonist against this aldosterone receptor and prevents the action of aldosterone and pre prevents reabsorption of sodium and water. So that is the basic mechanism of action. And these receptors, it acts on the epithelial cells and non-epithelial cells present on the cardiac tissue, blood vessels, and the kidney. So these are the three areas uh, where these receptors are present on which epileronone acts and prevents the action of aldosterone on these receptors. So why why do we need epileronone, epileronone when we have spironolactone? So because this is more specific with regards to receptor action and compared to spironolactone, it's binding to other receptors. Like if you recall, spironolactone can cause gynecomastia because it can bind to other receptors like androgen receptors, progesterone receptors, and glucocorticoid receptors. So esplerenone is more specific to aldosterone receptors only, and it showed decreased binding by up to 100 to 1,000 fold to these other receptors. And the occurrence of gynecomastia was non-existent in studies with eplerenone. So the adverse events, like in spinal, because it's a potassium spiring diuretic, so one of the adverse events is hyperkalemia. And there are two trials. There are three basic trials, uh, rail synthesis and epithesis trials. These are the, all three trials have come in NEJM. So the emphasis heart failure study and the epithesis are the two trials where they've used epileronone, and I'll show you those trials where they showed that gynecomastia is something that did not happen in patients who took epileronone when compared to spironolactone. So this is the distinct advantage of epileronone. So there are contraindications like in spironolactone, if someone has an hyperkalemia more than 5.5, or creatinine clearance less than 30 ml, it's a contraindication. And the metabolism is through cytochrome P3A4. So any drugs utilizing these enzymes for metabolism, so uh, so that will have, that can significantly increase the levels of epileronone in blood. And some of the agents which inhibit this cytochrome P3A4 are the azole uh, antifungal, Clarithromycin and protease inhibitor. So these are the agents which inhibit this enzyme, and the metabolism of epileronone needs this enzyme. So if this enzyme is inhibited, the levels of epileronone can significantly go up, and that may obviously lead to deleterious effects of more hyperkalemia, so on and so forth. So one has to be cautious if macrolides, azoles, and protease inhibitors are on board when you are using epileronone. And some of the relative contraindications is diabetes with microalbuminuria. Or if there is a concomitant usage of other potassium sparing diuretics or potassium supplementation is being given to the patient. So these are some of the contraindications when using this drug. So let's jump into the studies. So why we believe now espleronone has to replace spironolactone. So there are few studies. The first study on the benefit of uh, potassium sparing diuretic came from this uh, particular study called the RAILS trial. Just keep an eye on this author. So the Pit B uh, is the gentleman who has done most studies on potassium sparing diuretic. And even the U emphasis trial and emphasis trial, he is one of the authors. So this was the old study which came in 1999, published in NEJM. And all the trials with uh, epileronone and spironolactone have come in NEJM. So this was a French group which did this study. The effect of spironolactone on morbidity and mortality in patients with severe heart failure. So here the dosage that they used spironolactone was 25 to 50 milligram of spironolactone. And they showed it significantly reduced the mortality in patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And this mortality reduction was found both in chronic heart failure, even in acute post-MI heart failure setting, with reduced ejection fraction, it showed reduction in the mortality. So, and this is possibly formed the premise as to why spironolactone is given in patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. 
So then came this efficacious trial, which is known a selective aldosterone blocker in patients with LV dysfunction after MI. As you see, the author is the same, Pit B. So he, uh, again, this came in NEGM 2003. So done by both US and the uh, French authors. So here they used 25 to 50 milligram epilaronone and they showed it significantly reduced the mortality in the group which got epilaronone in patients who had LV dysfunction. And they, here they looked at composite endpoint of cardiovascular mortality and hospitalization and that also was significantly reduced with the use of epilaronone. So based on this Ephesus trial, which came in 2003, where the composite endpoint of cardiovascular mortality and the hospitalization came down. So the, there was a class one recommendation of incorporating epilaronone by American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology and European Society of Cardiology. So because of this particular trial, so this drug was incorporated in, as a class one recommendation in all these guidelines. So this is the emphasis heart failure trial, which came again in NEGM in 2011, done by Zanet et al, came from the French group, epilaronone in patients with systolic heart failure and mild symptoms. Here, they use the same dosage, 25 to 50 milligram of epilaronone. Even in this study, it showed significant reduction in mortality and significant reduction in hospitalization. And they did find hyperkalemia in 0.6% of the patients, but this hyperkalemia was statistically non-significant in this particular trial. So, although hyperkalemia can occur, but it did not attain statistical significance. So, then the question comes, which patients with heart failure should not receive uh, epilaronone or mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist? So, the recommendation is patients with NYHA class 2 with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction who have a stable disease and who, who are asymptomatic on AC inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blocker and who are on beta blockers, but they have a stable disease and their NYHA is in class 2 and who have normal anti pro BNP. So these are the patients where one may not want to put on epilaronone or, or, or potassium sparing diuretic. So this is the group where you can avoid. But of course, in patients who are symptomatic, even on these and who have high BNP, epilaronone has a big role to play. So what about then the question is now we have heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. So in ICU, we see distinct group of patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So is there any role? So that answer came from TopCat trial. So this is the most recent trial which came in 2014. Look at the author. Again, it's by Pitt, Pitt B et al. So, so this author has pretty much done most studies in Epiranon. So spironolactone for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So so they found that there was no reduction in composite endpoint where they looked at cardiovascular mortality or aborted cardiac arrest and they looked at hospitalization as a composite endpoint and they did not find benefit with the use of epilaronone in heart failure with preserved. So the evidence is for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. They did not find the benefit in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So what are the other advantages? So now the question is, okay, spironolactone versus epilaronone. So we, we saw that epilaronone do not have gynecomastia because it has a reduced affinity to progesterone receptors and to glucocorticoid receptors on and so forth. What are, is there any other additional advantages? Spironolactone has shown to increase the HbA1c and cortisol levels and which is not the case with epilaronone. And pyranolactone reduces adenobactin. That's why they have more of fat accumulation and gynecomastia. So these effects are not seen in s -pleranol. So these are the distinct advantages of s -pleranol. So the summary, uh, so as I said, the mechanism of action is epilaronone is a aldosterone receptor antagonist, which acts on, and these receptors are present in the cardiac muscle, on the blood vessels, and on the kidney. So there are three studies, rails, Ephesis and emphasis trial, all three shows reduced mortality in patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, but there is no benefit in patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction that came from the top cat trial. So if you possibly remember this much with regard to epilaronone, that's good enough. These are the three trials. So Ephesus and emphasis are the ones which showed 
significant benefit and some of the contraindications is someone who has hyperkalemia or creatinine clearance less than 30 one should not use so going forward it looks like epiluronone is the more desirable choice compared to spironolactone because most of these cardiac patients will have diabetes so you would not want to have any drug having an impact on increasing hba1c and fat accumulation so looks like this is a drug here to stay and uh, maybe for all our heart failure in ICU with reduced ejection fraction rather than spironolactin which we are traditionally using, maybe epiluronone is something which we could safely use would be my submission. So thank you one and all. So I request uh, all my listeners to present their valuable work in this Journal of Acute Care which comes every three months. You can visit my website www.drgitrangapa.com to read her to this lecture. Thank you. Thank you one and all.